Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Ben, last week at this time, we talked about how uh, we had no idea how our listeners would feel about the debate because it hasn't happened yet and it was hard to predict. And I have to say, uh, there's no world in which I could have imagined it was going to be as bad as it actually was. That was an abomination. Yeah, uh, it was a dumpster fire within a dumpster fire. And uh, I was just, you know, having done debate prep, as we talked about, like, I, I also don't know how you prep somebody for that you no. know like i <laughs> i was so very sympathetic to joe biden because like i'm sure he went in there with some points he wanted to make and some you know lines he'd practiced and it, how on earth do you deal with a, a raving lunatic spouting COVID at you from across the stage i, I don't you know? know man i don't know and look if, if you if you can't get enough of this punishment uh the vice presidential debate will happen this evening wednesday if you're listening the day this comes out as you should be you can hear kamala harris and vice president mike pence square off if you want to watch it live with us because we all need a little bit of humor go to crooked.com slash debate we're going to stream the whole thing we'll do our fun group thread crooked.com slash debate but man i i if i'm kamala harris I, I don't think i would do this thing like how does she know mike pence doesn't have COVID right now she doesn't yeah i mean i i just you know what? it's just not worth it i mean it, like what what is gained uh i mean we all now know that joe biden was likely put at grave risk you know by appearing at that debate these people have lost control they can't protect themselves from covid why should we trust that they're going to protect kamala harris and joe biden like, right. there's just no reason to debate these lunatics it, uh, especially when they're just gonna lie you know let's talk about the big news ben uh, i'm not sure if you've heard but donald trump melania trump half the White House. Uh, they've all gotten <laughs> coronavirus. Totally understandable if you if you missed it. So obviously, this is a big deal. Despite all the happy talk from Trump, his lackeys, his doctor, like the battle with this, the disease is by no means over. And so I wanted to ask you about the potential national security implications. Obviously, if Trump is incapacitated for any period of time and he has to actually transfer power to the VP, that's a huge deal. But I'm also seeing a lot of you know, kind of hyperbolic doomsday stuff about yeah. the Russians or the Chinese doing something drastic while uh, Trump is, you know, sick or the military having to bypass the the West Wing to take action or the, yeah. you know, the national security team being too sick to function effectively. And while I certainly think it's fair to worry about all these things, to worry that adversaries might take actions when they think we're distracted, people should just know we have a massive intelligence, diplomatic, and military infrastructure that operates independently of like how many people are sick in the White House. You know, look today the report yeah. that the the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mark Milley, and almost the entire Joint Chiefs of Staff will have to quarantine after coming in contact with the Vice Commandant of the Coast Guard, who later tested positive for COVID. So that is a very big deal. But again, like few folks are uh, better equipped to work from home than like four-star generals. They basically bring the office yeah. with them wherever they go. I remember the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, joining situation room meetings via video conference from his airborne plane. So that gives you a sense of their capabilities. Yeah. Ben, what do you think the, the national security equities are that are at stake here? Are there things that you really worry about or, I don't know, is continuity sort of built into the system? You know, there, there are two things that we have to se separate out here, right? Like one is, okay, yes. I mean, in the event of a nuclear war, you know, um, you know, the system is designed so that the president can make a decision in a matter of minutes, if not seconds, in the event of a nuclear war that, that was built in the Cold War. And that's why there's a nuclear football. And that's why, right. that's frankly why there's like Marine One and all these things. Um, that's not very likely, you know. Uh, and by the way, if that were to happen... Um, we'd already have a bigger problem than yeah, Trump's no health. Uh, the, the second thing is just, yeah, this idea that him being incapacitated or on drugs is going to open up space for adversaries to do things. That is, is fundamentally flawed because it presupposes that Trump was somehow some engaged commander in chief <laughs> reading his presidential daily briefing and giving direction to diplomats and military officers around the world. Yeah. That hasn't happened for Never four once. years. And it sure as hell hasn't happened in the last several months uh, under COVID. So the, the U S national security apparatus has kind of been running on autopilot with Trump's occasional interjections via tweet or directive or politicization of our foreign policy. So, no, I don't. Some of these things I've read about, this is like the most dangerous national security situation to have Trump, you know, sick. I mean, that, you, again, you're presupposing that Trump was doing that job anyway. Um, 
what I will say, what does concern me, though, is that America is a mess. We are in an unstable period. The transition, if Biden wins, is a very worrisome period. You know, you'll have a, 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 an administration on the way out, probably burning things down, settling scores, making corrupt deals with the Saudis, uh, sanctioning Iran. Um, and, and you, 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 you know, you won't just have the normal instability of a transition where there's an outgoing president, and an incoming one, which is sometimes a period of time when nations do things. Nations go to war. Nations test the United States. Um, that worries me. It, it's just that we're in this kind of period of instability I, I honestly don't think that Trump being sick, you know, exacerbates it that much because, frankly, it just means he's working even less on the stuff that he doesn't pay much attention to. I, frankly, the national security threat is, is Trump infecting people yeah. um, like the military. I mean, that uh, I mean, let's you can't overstate it. Like people can't go to work in the White House because they're afraid of getting sick. The chairman's joint chief of staff is quarantined. Like that's a problem. But. Uh, I, I don't think it's uh, you know quite as big a problem that, that Trump you know is at the hospital or something. Yeah, I'm a little less concerned about uh, the White House not standing up to China when they cracked down on Hong Kong since they already cracked down on Hong Kong. And yeah, they already the did that. Did yeah. With China, so yeah. So, so well, far, uh, that's the point. Is, all, yeah, all the things that people say that the adversaries might make a move because they think the United States is distracted. Well, yeah, Russia poisoned Alexei Navalny, the leading oppositionist. China passed national security laws to basically swallow up Hong Kong. This has happened this summer because they saw that Trump was distracted, right, or yeah. doesn't care. So we're already living in that world. Yeah, we're all living that one. Um, let's turn to India for a minute because uh, I think this is a very big deal and it's not getting a lot of attention for understandable reasons. Uh, last week, Amnesty International announced that they were halting operations in India after Prime Minister Modi froze their bank accounts. So for those who aren't familiar with Amnesty's work, it's a widely respected nonprofit, uh, the advocate on behalf of human rights. A lot of that work involves documenting and publicizing human rights abuses. And that's what got them on Modi's radar. So a friend of the pod, uh, Rana Ayub, had a great piece about this in the Washington Post. February feels like a billion years ago. But remember, at that time, there were these really scary riots and violence against Muslims in India. And Amnesty documented instances where police officers in Delhi were aiding and abetting the rioters. They were giving them rocks. They were like, you know, helping them hurt people. Um, Amnesty has also called out arbitrary detentions and excessive force being used in Kashmir. Modi did not like any of that. He has a history of being someone who has benefited from and been in charge when uh, Hindus attacked Muslims in India. Uh, and so this is a real sensitive point for him. So he basically used a law that restricts how non-governmental organizations like Amnesty can spend money to harass them essentially out of the country. And the specifics of how are, are less important uh, than the fact that this is a trend among authoritarian governments. Russia has cracked down hard on NGOs like Amnesty International. NGOs have been restricted or prevented from operating uh, in places like Egypt, Turkey, Hungary. So I just really wanted to flag this one because it, it's part of a set of uh, anti-democratic actions by Modi that should really worry us. I mean, this is the stuff you see from Putin. You shouldn't see it in a democracy. Relatedly, Ben, the LA Times ran a piece a couple days ago about how Indian journalists who have reported on government mismanagement of the pandemic are facing prosecution and intimidation. They counted 55 journalists who have been arrested, investigated, or questioned by Indian police. So I don't know, Ben, like, how worried are you about what we're learning about the trajectory for India's democracy? What tools do you think are at Biden's or the next president's disposal to, to counteract it? Well, I'll put in a brief plug. Episode five of Missing America really goes deep on this with Rana Ayub, yeah. um, who's just a terrific, terrific, terrific reporter in person. But I, I think it's it's very worrying. And, and as we go through in that episode, that, that Modi, particularly since he's been reelected um, in the last year, has you know, been unsubtle about moving in an undemocratic and Hindu nationalist direction. And this move where you essentially start to kick out civil society, restrict civil society, kick out international human rights organizations. Yeah, that's part of the playbook. But it's a playbook used by countries like Russia, you know, not by what's supposed to be the world's largest democracy, India, this, you know, vibrant, dynamic place of people from different religions and different backgrounds. And, and, and Modi is methodically dismantling that. Per our last conversation, Tommy, like, this is the kind of thing you do when you think, well, maybe Joe Biden will win. And 
you know, I'm going to, you know, run through this playbook as fast as I can so I don't have to deal with an American president giving me any grief over it because Donald Trump certainly isn't going to pick up the phone and be like, what are you doing with Amnesty International? Um, so that worries me, too. In terms of, of what can be done, I mean, I, I do think that the U.S., you know, just we, one, we have to set a better example on these things, which Trump hasn't done. And, and I wouldn't discount that because a lot of what Modi's done is kind of ripped from the Trump playbook, too. Like he has his version of a Muslim ban um, among, you know, talks about the fake news, spreads disinformation. Um, so set a better example. I think, secondly, you know, incorporating human rights into our bilateral relationship more and raising these issues more directly. I think, you know, India traditionally has been a country that, you know, cares about what America thinks, cares about international opinion. And right now, Modi clearly feels no pressure from that direction. I think another piece of this that's interesting is that Modi has gotten a lot of support and the BJP, his party, has gotten a lot of support from the United States, from the Indian diaspora here, which is very influential here and in India. And and I just think this isn't a problem solved by government alone. And, and you know, this point was made by Ro Khanna, an Indian American whose grandfather was actually imprisoned in India, um, supporting Gandhi's uh, movement for independence, you know, that the, the diaspora needs to start speaking up too. And, and, and their voices carry a lot of weight. And they've actually been generally uh, favorable to Modi. But I think we just, you know, we have to see this for what it is, which is somebody moving a country, something we've seen, you know, in Turkey, something we've seen in Hungary. But this is, you know, a country of a billion people, the world's largest democracy, moving it in the di- direction of a one-party repressive state. And and that's that's in the long run not good for India because holding a country together of a billion people, you know, you, you can do it really in kind of two ways. <laughs> One is a democracy that allows everybody to feel like they have a voice. And the other is what we see in China, right? And and I think India will be in the long run much better off if it embraces its diversity and its pluralism and its openness. Um, that's what sets it apart from China. Um, yep. and, 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 and so I think this should be on the agenda for the Biden administration, even though I'm sure they'll want to have a good strategic partnership with India. Yeah, and, the, and I heard part of today's uh, Missing America episode this morning, and I heard Jake talking about sort of having a conference of democracies to talk about this sort of set of issues to make sure we have our own houses in order and I guess you know hopefully put pressure on some of these more authoritarian uh, tendencies yeah. uh, among some of the leaders to, to try to fix it while we still can. So one we'll watch, I'm sure, uh, very much on Biden's radar. Uh, another issue that's sort of breaking as of today, it looks like there may be a coup in, in, in Kyrgyzstan. So there's reports that opposition groups have taken control uh, of government buildings in the capital following protests over uh, a, allegations of vote rigging, basically, in Sunday's parliamentary election. Uh, Kyrgyzstan's Central Election Commission said that they're going to annul the results of that election, which had awarded the majority of seats to the current president. CNN's reporting that uh, one person has been killed 590 were wounded. Uh, with apologies to Jordan Waller, uh, I'm not even going to try the name of the current president, but he is saying that this is a coup. Uh, the opposition has freed the former president who was in prison, where he was being held on, on corruption charges. So it's not clear if these opposition groups uh, are going to try to reinstall the former president. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is, is a is former Soviet republic uh, of just over 6 million people. They've dealt with multiple coups over the last couple decades. Ben, can you help like listeners understand why this matters to the U.S. or sort of why this matters geopolitically? Well, you know, Kyrgyzstan is one of these Central Asian countries that is kind of balanced between Russian influence, Chinese influence, and, and a degree of U.S. influence. So they basically become a country that is subjected to a lot of corruption fueled by either Russian interests or Chinese interests, or in some cases, you know, Western corporate interests. Um, and, and, you know, there's a small country that has trouble resisting those antibodies. You know, they're, they're, why is it important? I mean, it's important baseline because people everywhere deserve functioning democratic institutions, elections where their votes are counted and their leaders aren't on the take. And, and so we should support those principles everywhere. Um, I think it's also important because, you know, the extent to which a Russia is seeking to try to dictate or shape events um, in former Soviet republics has been a, a growing trend. And so mm-hmm. watch what Russia does here. Watch what hand they play. The Chinese are pumping more money into places like Kyrgyzstan. So in, in some ways, this kind of sometimes becomes either a competition of influence between Russia or China, or sometimes they, they back the same person. Obviously, what we want to see is this to have a democratic outcome where you know elections are determining leaders and not repeated coups. 
Kyrgyzstan is up against a lot. I mean, they're not in a democratic neighborhood. <laughs> when no. you look at, no. at you know Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, um, but I mean, I, I you know I think it's important. Uh, you know, you, this is why you'd want a functioning international system, and you'd want the, the United Nations to be a venue to be raising these issues. That's not currently the case. I don't know enough about these protests to speak uh, with any kind of authority whatsoever about what's motivating them. But you know, when you watch the images, it's like how many countries are we seeing people who are just fed up, you know, in this case, they're literally scaled the fence of their white house. And it's, it's actually called yeah. the white house. Um, I mean, there's something happening out there. We keep saying this, but I mean, how many countries have we now talked about on the show where people basically got fed up with the mixture of corruption and anti-democratic behavior? I, I think to that point about that Jake made about a democratic conference, like the idea of trying to, to the U S once again, if Biden wins, trying to breathe momentum into the popular mobilizations that we're seeing and give them some structure and give them some agenda that is common and give them some sense of international support is going to be really important to give these people a fighting chance who are just trying to protest for the same things. Again, I think it's too early to tell exactly what the the source of these protests is. So it's I don't think we can put this in a Belarus category yet. You can't help but think something is happening out there. People are just fed up and this is going to keep happening. And, and the U.S. needs to get its arms around this and try to mobilize the world's democracies to, to, to play a role to support people. Staying in the same general neighborhood for a minute. So last week we talked about fighting between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, in the disputed Nagorno-Karabakh region. So that territory that we talked about is part of Azerbaijan, but the population is mostly Armenian and the area is functionally controlled by Armenian separatist groups that are backed by the Armenian government. Complicating matters, again, is the fact that Turkey is allied with Azerbaijan, Russia is al allied with Armenia, so it becomes this proxy battle. And so, unfortunately, Ben, it sounds like Turkey is really upping the ante. Uh, the New York Times reported that the Armenian prime minister called the White House, I think he talked to the National Security Advisor, to basically say, hey, why is no one stopping Turkey from using American-made F-16 jets in these bombing raids uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh? Uh, you know, Turkey is a NATO ally. You guys sold them this hardware. And so, you know, Ben, it was troubling to read this because you could see a scenario where this escalates further, NATO gets drawn in, et cetera. So two part question. I mean, first, just like a temperature check on how worried you are uh, about the latest uh, here. And the second question is sort of to your point earlier and, and about Russia. I mean, Russia views Eastern Europe, the Caucasus region, Central Asia as part of their sphere of influence. How do you think Putin feels about a possible coup in Kyrgyzstan, intense fighting between Azerbaijan and Armenia, and nearly two months of pretty intense political turmoil in Belarus? I, I, I suspect he's not in love with that going on at once. Yeah, you know, to, to your last point, you're exactly right. These are two other former Soviet republics, you know. Um, and so th this idea that has been built up that Putin is this master, you know, mastermind, chess master, orchestrating events in all these places, these are not the events he'd be orchestrating, right? No. And and you see on his periphery, you know, a mix of instability and corruption and de democratic protests, right? So I think it does highlight that, that, that let, let's tone down the idea that just because it was so easy for, for him to have a mark in the White House doesn't mean... Uh, that there's an inevitability to it, even in, in the former Soviet Union. I, I'm very concerned about this. And um, look, like it's a contested area, uh, but let's let's like also unpack some of this. Like watching this, it does feel like, you know, number one, Azerbaijan and Turkey feel like the aggressors here. You know, um, at a minimum, they've been escalating things. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you see you know, Turkey coming in. Uh, number two, um, Armenia had a very hopeful democratic transition in recent years where, you know, there was there was a protest movement that led to a change in government and they're trying to do the right things. Azerbaijan is the opposite. You know, they've got one of these guys who's been in charge forever, you know, kind of a former Soviet apparatchik, you know. Um, and and so, you know, I, 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 it's hard for your sympathies not to lie with the, the democracy here. And then number three, as was underscored at a protest here in Los Angeles uh, of the Armenian American community. You know, the historical echoes of Turkey um, going into, you know, a contested area and killing Armenians is yep. not good. You know, yep. I mean, this is a country, Turkey, that undertook a genocide against Armenia, uh, you know, and, and 
and frankly, the reason Armenia is such a small state is in part because they were driven, you know, into this small enclave, landlocked, you know. So I, I do think that the, the recent events, you know, in what has always been seen as a frozen conflict and, 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 and a difficult issue to resolve, you know, the, the balance does seem to be tipping of sympathy towards Armenia in this picture. And, um, and so, again, I think for the U.S. and Europe to try to play a constructive role to just end this fighting and de-escalate the situation uh, and make the point I, I've said before in the show, like Turkey is a NATO ally like that. There's no reason that that has to be inevitable. You know, um, they're, they're not behaving as a democracy and they're, you know, we should be looking at whether or not the, the benefits of, of Tur- Turkey's full participation in NATO are worth, you know, the, the uh, challenge to NATO's existence as an alliance of democracies that yeah. shows, res- you know, restraint in global affairs. You know. It's also interesting to see how, uh, pockets of Armenian Americans are pretty well organized. Like the mayor of Los Angeles put out a statement about the fighting. I thought that was interesting <laughs> yeah. and reflected some effective and intense lobbying probably from his constituents. And Los Angeles has the second largest Armenian, it's the second largest Armenian city in the world. Um, you know, and this is not just the Kardashians here, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a ton of Armenians live in, in Los Angeles, including, by the way, the deputy mayor of Los Angeles, uh, uh, Nina Hachigian, who worked in the Obama administration with me. Um, but I think also it, it does demonstrate that like a, an organized uh, diaspora community, you know, can have an important voice. And, you know, that can be, you know, good, bad in between. But I, I, I think it's it, it, it's usually a good that um, that they're raising, you know, the the perspectives of people who might not otherwise be heard in, yeah. in American foreign policy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. This is definitely like a, 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 a white hat uh, attempt. This is a more white raise hat raise awareness thing, yeah. about, you know, violence that is hurting both sides of a conflict. So good for that. Yeah. Um, one last thing on Russia. So Ben, this weekend on CBS's face, the nation Trump's national security advisor, Robert O'Brien said that during recent meetings with his Russian counterpart in Geneva, he warned him that there would be no tolerance for any interference (laughs) in the November election. And this is a real quote, Ben. The Russians have committed to doing so. Uh, So there you have it, an ironclad commitment uh, from the Russians brought directly to you from the national security advisor. In his defense, he did the whole like trust but verify, blah, blah, blah thing. But the fact that he even would regurgitate that is absurd. No mention of the fact that the FBI director testified uh, testified about ongoing Russian interference back in September, right? Never mind that the CIA has reportedly determined that Putin is directing these efforts to help Trump. Ignore all the tech companies that have released evidence of Russian interference so far this year. Uh, I don't know about you, man. I, I don't really feel safe for having heard O'Brien's assurances. And also, just having talked to John Brennan and read the book a minute ago, like, can you imagine John, who was, by the way, the first person to call over to the Russians in 16 and say, knock it off? Obviously, that was not effective. It might have been too late. But I just can't imagine, like, John regurgitating the Russian line to a, a U.S. audience like that. It's absurd. Yeah. Well, the whole thing is absurd. It's the whole thing is patently ridiculous. I mean, you know, Trump himself stood there with Putin and said, you know, he trusted Putin that they didn't interfere in the last election when we knew they did. The Russians know that Trump is not going to hold them accountable. The Russians know that whatever O'Brien said to them, if somehow Trump wins, it's not like Trump is going to like look into it or have consequences yeah. on them Brian for what they did, for you know. <laughs> Give me a break. And, and there, but, but look, and who is this guy? I mean, like this is the guy like a couple of years ago what he was trying to get ASAP Rocky out of a prison, you know, in Scandinavia. Like what, th- this guy doesn't get enough attention because, you know, he's not quite as nefarious as Bill Barr just because he's more incompetent. Um, but this guy's a total flunky for Trump, you know. And, and so the whole point of this was him for him to kind of appear like he did something and give them a talking point. I mean, that's all this was, is so that from now to the election, if people ask him about Russian interference, they can say, well, Brian delivered a strong message and the Russians assured him of this when nobody believes it. I mean, it, yeah. it's just it is what it is. It's a joke. Total joke. Um, so uh, Jordan Waller, the producer mentioned earlier here at Crooked Media, who's going to be mad at me for my terrible lack of pronunciation ability, uh, flagged this amazing story from 2018 that is weird and odd and worth talking about despite its age. So Vice News did a piece about this proliferation of music videos that are written uh, and produced by militaries. It came up in this context because the lead example in the story is Azerbaijan's state uh, border service, who they've been fighting with Armenia. So 
Ben, imagine like the the typical cheesy bullshit, like normal '80s rock video. But then you give the producers, who is probably not Spike Jones in this in this instance, like military hardware to play with, right? Like tanks, helicopters, navy ships, rocket launchers, real stuff, real troops. Uh, China and Russia have made music videos to help them recruit. Iraq has these like music video hype videos. Stepping back, like the U.S. does similar stuff. We'll put the link <laughs> yeah. to the story in show notes, right? But it does raise a question that's sort of been swirling in my head for a while about the ethical and moral lines about military recruiting to like 17, 18 year old, younger maybe audiences. Is it wrong or unethical to portray war as a music video? What about Top Gun? What about other military movies? Yeah, what yeah. about the military recruiting on Twitch by having service members play Call of Duty against other people? You know, I don't have a good answer, but I thought it was an interesting conversation in debate that starts with us sort of like, laughing at these goofy music videos yeah. from abroad, but like should probably lead to some introspection <laughs> about how we're, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. how we're talking yeah. about the military in the U S like 13 year old kids on Twitch. Yeah. I mean, on the light side, you can look at it and it is funny, but I'm unfortunately going to take it to the darker side, which is, well, yeah. like, as you say, you know, we grew up with this subtext, right? I mean, yeah. Top gun, totally romanticizing the experience of being a fighter pilot you know, but a whole history of movies that did that on top of the basic advertising, the few, the proud, you know, the the, the whole thing. Yeah. But then, I, you know, I think where it got a little darker, frankly, is like you got video games like Call of Duty, right? You, you know, you got a gamer set that, you know, I think is probably being targeted by the military for recruitment because it's like, oh, you like the video game? Well, you know, why don't you try out the new thing? Um, and in the U.S., part of what happened is as, as things got worse in the post-9-11 wars, they also started lowering kind of certain requirements for who could join the military. Um, and, you, you know, the idea of appealing to, look, I, I think there's a good in it, right? There's a good in the sense of like, the military has given a sense of purpose and structure to people who didn't otherwise have it. And there's enormous success stories of people, you know, who were somewhat lost and found themselves in the military and went on to have great careers. But I, I do think you have to be mindful that, you know, are, are you, suggesting to people that this is a video game are you you know because the real experience is going to be quite different you know yeah. and are you are you in your recruitment process um you know w are you making sure that you're looking hard at the personality type so that you're not I don't know, letting in the wrong people who might be in it for the wrong reasons so it is it is worth considering you know hopefully if we get out of these forever wars um you know looking at at how we recruit and looking at at, at the ways in which, you know, we are, you know, projecting the military experience to people <laughs> to, 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 to draw them in. And I would hope that there's less, you know, appeal to people that this is like Call of Duty or this is like a, a movie and more like, no, this is about service and it may be very hard, but it, it can also be very rewarding. Yeah. And look, this is not just a military problem, right? There was Zero Dark Thirty in the way it's sort of was seen as a recruiting tool for the CIA. But I, I agree with you, like, I think if you're portraying war as a game or as glamorous yeah. or as That's cool, the problem, yeah. That is uh, dangerously misleading to someone who could lose their life in service of the country. So yes, bring it back to first principles. Um, let's turn to Ethiopia, because uh, the BBC reported that Ethiopia has banned all flights over this mega dam project uh, they are building on a tributary of the Nile River, the Blue Nile, citing security concerns. And I thought it was a way, a good way into this discussion because this dam has become a huge source of tension in the region and we should talk about it. So the, it's called the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam or GERD. It is massive. This thing is gonna cost $5 billion. And once it begins producing electricity in the next year or so, it will be the biggest hydroelectric plant uh, in Africa uh, and it could, prov could provide power to up to 65 million people in Ethiopia. So you can understand why the government would want to do this. The problem is the river, the Blue Nile, flows north into Sudan and then to Egypt, and it could constrain their water. And Egypt called the dam a threat of existential proportions. That's a quote, because they get basically all their water from the Nile. Uh, and this reduces the flow, obviously. And so the U.S. has tried to broker a diplomatic agreement, uh, but that has failed thus far. About a month ago, the U.S. Uh, some U.S. officials were quoted saying they would cut aid to Ethiopia. You know, militaries are are sort of like on alert in case something happens. I think that's why this flyover uh, restriction happened. So Ben, you know, a couple of reasons I thought this was worth talking about. First, like it's just a major dispute between 
three big, well-armed countries. And then second, I do think that people should be aware that, you know, water disputes and water scarcity like this is likely to increase in the, in the near future because of climate change. This feels like a test case. I don't know, is there anything else you think that people need to know uh, or is there anything you know you think can be done to mediate this, or is this just like a zero sum existential thing for these countries? Yeah, no, I, I well, your last point is one I was going to hit, which is that you know this get ready for a lot more of this. You know, yeah. um, as resources become more scarce because of climate change, while populations grow and the need to provide people with energy and electricity and the like, uh, you know, becomes more acute. This came up at the Obama administration, and it, you know we began to mediate some of this and and. There's no substitute for trying to get these countries into some form of dialogue so they can determine how to share the resources, how to address concerns of other countries as you build projects like this, maybe perhaps how to share in the output of projects like this. Um, oftentimes, regional organizations can be useful in, in addressing this, right? So in Southeast Asia, there's a, uh, ASEAN is a grouping of 10 countries there that addresses a lot of these shared environmental concerns. You know. Egypt and Ethiopia, both part of the African Union. So part of what you'd like to see is is diplomacy, you know, including engagement by world powers like the U.S., but also at the regional level to just start to figure out what is a fair way to, you know, share resources that flow through multiple countries. Um, because otherwise, what you're going to have increasingly with climate change is the risk of resource wars, um, where people are going to be back in the business of fighting over things like water. You know. Right. Right. Uh, two more lighter things before we get to John Brennan. So big breaking news here. Uh, last week, the Irish Supreme Court ruled that the bread served at Subway, like Subway subs, is not legally considered <laughs> bread because it has too much sugar in it. Instead, they have ruled that it is technically a confectionery. So this case ended up in Ireland's legal system because in Ireland, bread is considered a staple and therefore it is not subject to their VAT, their value added tax, like sales tax. But pastries and ice cream and other sweets are taxed. So here's the rub. <laughs> a six inch sub roll from Subway contains five grams of sugar. That exceeds Ireland's standard. And just for context, like a standard sugar cube, if we have any listeners in the UK, they'll get this instantly. That is four grams of sugar. I guess a McDonald's Big Mac bun has even more sugar than a Subway sub. That's 5.8 grams. So this is all diligently reported out by The Guardian, who also report, uh, reminded us that in 2014, Subway removed a flour whitening agent from its baked goods that is used to manufacture yoga mats and rug pads. So that is delicious. Uh, in a statement to The Guardian, a Subway rep said, quote, Subway's bread is, of course, Bread, end quote. So there you have it. Uh, I'm very mad about this. I naively thought uh, that Subway was the healthy option when I was driving reporters around in, in downstate Illinois or living in Iowa or the campaign trail or on a road trip for the last couple of decades. Uh, very upsetting stuff then. Upsetting news. I hope you didn't fall for those ad campaigns either, right? You know, <laughs> where it's like, you know, eat, eat nothing but Subway and lose like 100 pounds or something. Yeah, that guy um, uh, didn't end well for him, so no. no. Yeah, that guy had a bit of a fall from grace. Uh, so so we won't go there. Um, I, look, yeah, it could be a backdoor way for the, and a clever way, frankly, for the Irish to, to raise a little more revenue. Um, and, and, you know, you see stuff like this. This is kind of nuts and bolts of, of international relations, right? Is like, uh, you know, can I get a little more advantage and in, in, in a little more revenue out of that, that Subway bread? But I mean, I got to tell you, like, I've had my concerns about the Subway meats. Um, uh, in, in, uh -oh. They don't, well, they don't, like, I, I mean, it doesn't always look exactly like that meat, you know? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it reminded me, I mean, I, I'm glad Subway's not a, a sponsor of the show. There's no promo code here. But, um, uh, you know, remind me of the KFC thing, right? Remember when KFC was found not yeah. to be chicken, so they couldn't mm -hmm. call it Kentucky Fried Chicken? And I think, you know, KFC took corrective action here. So if the outcome of this is that Subway has a little less sugar in their bread, you know, that's everybody can win in the end, right? That is a good um, outcome. So Subway could, like, you know, make this a little healthier, a little less sugar, you know, that might make it a little less addictive, but still. Uh, and then they won't have to pay this VAT tax in, uh, in Ireland. Yeah. So uh, the, the former spokesman for Subway, Jared Fogel, went to jail for having child pornography on his computer, which is depraved and disgusting. And I hope he stays there for a very long time. But before that happened, I remember he got sent up to Capitol Hill 
for some reason. I don't know why. It's probably part of this stupid advertising campaign. And like, again, I really did like constantly eat Subway on the campaign trail. It just was like easier than like Wendy's or whatever. It felt healthier. And I remember Obama ran into Jer uh, Jared and like he like leaked it to the press or whatever that Obama said something great about Subway. And we we're like, Senator, did you actually say this? And he was like, no. I, I He ran up to me and asked me about Subway and, and Obama said to him, how do you eat that shit every day? <laughs> but they leaked it out like it was some super favorable thing. So whatever, Subway's fine. I will back in the day, b back in the day, I was a Blimpies guy. Oh, um, okay. But I guess uh, so. Maybe that I'm biased. But Blimpies is probably not was not the right name for like a post fast food health concern. No. <laughs> you know, like no. it didn't convey the right message. You know, so uh, they lost out to Subway. Yeah, they, they zagged when everybody else zagged. What's the one in Chicago that has the really good subs? <laughs> Oh, help me oh, out. It was Jimmy John's. Jimmy John's. Jimmy John's right? is good. The other one, I always got the wreck. Brain is broken. Oh, Pot Belly? Pot Belly. You're a Pot Belly guy? Love Pot yeah, Belly. Yeah. Pot yeah. Belly. Thank yeah, they're Jordan. big in DC. There, there, was a, there was a Pot Belly kitty corner of the White House. Um, and I used to hit that. I, I used to hit the breakfast sandwiches there, too. They're yeah, yeah. excellent. For the uh, once every six months, you left the building to eat food. Uh, yeah. Last topic. So uh, we're going to talk a little English, English Premier League football because Arsenal, uh, the EPL team, uh, they are taking heat because they fired their mascot, Gunnar Soros, after 27 years of service. If you want to imagine Gunnar Soros in your head, imagine Yoshi from Mario Kart uh, in an Arsenal jersey in a red baseball cap, and he's about eight feet tall. That's him. Uh, the mascot was played by a human being named Jerry Kwai since 1993. And I guess the rationale for firing him was to say, uh, you know, we don't have in-person fans or games, so why have a mascot? which just is dumb. The good news is someone set up a GoFundMe page that said, let's keep him going for another 65 million years and save him from twerking on OnlyFans for a living. Uh, so the good news, it sounds like this is going to be reversed. Uh, but Ben, I don't know, how many billion dollar franchises uh, have owners that would fire a beloved mascot after 27 years? Maybe it's better business not to be a dick. Just a thought. Uh, yeah, I mean, these owners, right, uh, like these are basically billionaires, like the 1% of the 1%. I mean, cut the mascot a break here. Um, I'm a Met fan and, and um, you know, Mr. Met, uh, beloved. I mean, just beloved, right? I mean, the team is terrible, but the mascot is always there. He's got a big baseball head. He's always yep. got a smile on his face. And I'll tell you, actually, I um, when I moved out of my apartment in Queens to move down to D.C., uh, Mr. Met looked at my apartment. Really? He didn't wear the, the baseball head when he came. But I was like starstruck. I couldn't you know, believe that Mr. Met might actually move into my apartment. Um, oh, man. Along with those people who like fired the T-shirt cannons um, into the, the crowd. I mean, in all seriousness, these are not people making the big bucks, though. No, yeah, there's like they so, love the sport. Come on. Come on yeah, guys. they love the team. Yeah. Like, yeah, you're going to fire Wally the Green Monster. You're going to fire Pat the Patriot. Get out of here with that shit. Premier League is doing just fine, okay? Yeah. In fact, you guys have like encroached significantly on the American sports market. Like, I'm, you know, come on, just, yeah. just, just keep your mascot. Like, if we need, a, if do we need a mascot stimulus here? Um, we might. Well, Trump just tanked uh, all additional stimulus until after the election. So, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. you know, political genius there. I do have one plug, Tommy. We mentioned Khashoggi. This new documentary, um, Kingdom of Silence, uh, oh, about Saudi Arabia and MBS. Um, I, you know, full disclosure, I'm, I'm in it uh, a little bit, but um, they really did a great job at just like the story of Khashoggi's killing, who he actually was. They really bring him to life. And, and you know, a portrait of MBS that uh, is about as flattering as you think it'd be. So check it out. Uh, I think Where it's on it? Showtime, but it, you know, Showtime? it's okay. on Showtime, but they're making it, uh, you know, it was made available actually to all Washington Post subscribers too, which was cool um, by the Post. So that, that's my one plug for the week. Oh, that's a great plug. All right. Uh, well, with that, uh, we'll talk to you guys next week where we will be one week closer to everyone having voted in this nightmare of an election being over. So look forward to that. And many of you can vote now. So please yeah, get, vote. In get your ass to the poll. VoteSaveAmerica.com yeah. if you need more information. See you guys soon.